Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Both Barrels. I'm Burn. my father Curtis is over there, and we have some special guests today. We have our returning guest, Leah, and her mother also decided to join us, Lori. And we also have our very special friend, Joseph, from Iowa Brewing Company, and he has brought us a bunch of stuff to try out today. We brought a variety of beers we're going to go through, um, everything from like one of our most basic easy drinking beers up to some of our barrel aged varieties. I mean, we've got a Pilsner we're going to try today, um, our current seasonal, which is a really interesting, like, New England spin on the pale lager. Okay. Um, we've got a sour, we have a barrel aged scotch ale, uh, we've got a really fun uh, maple syrup amber, and then one of our big barrel aged imperial stouts. Sounds good. Here we're starting off with our Bohemian Rapids. That it's guy right there? This guy right here. Okay. Um, so, being a brewery here in Cedar Rapids, Cedar Rapids is Kind of like one of the central Czech communities uh, in America. We're home to the National Czech and Slovak Museum. Uh, we thought it was really important to do a proper Czech style Pilsner. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be Bohemian Rapids. The Czech Pilsners were the lager started mm -hmm. many, many years ago. Um, up to that point, it was all a variety of ales. And then came the lager, which uses a different type of yeast. It's light and crisp and refreshing and just took the world by storm and then all of a sudden over like about a century or so then it's lagers were everywhere and for the longest time lagers are pretty much all you could drink here in this country before all the craft beer started I have these lovely glasses from the ira brewing company yeah. located down on third street on the downtown is it considered southeast side yeah we're on the southeast side um in the downtown neighborhood sort of a uh, really between downtown and the Nubo district. The Czech Pilsner is the first. Mm -hmm. um, it's got a little bit more body, um, a little bit more hop character than all the Pilsners that would then follow. Because mm -hmm. um, then the, uh, the Germans picked up on it and made it a little bit crisper, and then the rest of continental Europe did it, and it came just a little bit, we'll say, smoother. And then it jumped the ocean over here, and um, they call some popular light beers Pilsners. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right. They're clean, they're really crisp. The, the one, we'll, we'll get into a little bit later, but uh, the lager world is, there's a lot of variety there. Um, mm -hmm. Everything from a really pale yellowish beer that's crystal clear like this one, up till uh, we do a, a really nice Baltic porter called Oja. Mm -hmm. And Oja actually uses a lager yeast. Mm. It's a little bit like a lager version of Russian Imperial Stout, so it's like higher alcohol, uh, big bold flavor, really dark and rich and roasty. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's not thick and chewy like its uh, stout counterpart would be. All right, so what's up next? The, um, the Pilsner features uh, Europe's traditional size hops. They're a little bit more herbal uh, tasting than what we're used to over here with all of our IPAs and pale ales of the hop focused beers. Um, we're going to jump into one of those. Um, this is our uh, current like spring seasonal. Um, it's called the New England Lager. So for the last uh, couple years here like the, the big hot style in craft beer has been these hazy juicy New England style IPAs mm -hmm. uh, they take the traditional IPA uh, lower the bitterness way down you get this really juicy sometimes drinks almost like a glass of orange juice kind of beers mm -hmm. um, we thought it would be fun to treat a pale lager that way um, being a brewery that likes to play with lagers which is a little bit different from say like the traditional craft brewery out there hear a lot like oh well Loggers are boring from like your average craft beer fan. Um, this is kind of a fun one. So this is really it's a pale lager. Mm -hmm. um, the whole New England IPA thing really comes from um, just not all the hops go in on the cold side, so you're not boiling them. When you boil hops, that's where most of that bitter flavor comes from. Mm -hmm. um, we get all the hop character from this from extensive dry hopping, and that's also really what provides that really hazy, almost glowing quality that it, your beer has. It kind of does taste like juice. It is yeah. a very, very juicy, juicy lager. I, it reminds me of an IPA, actually. Yeah. It, that's what I thought it tasted like, an IPA. Yeah. Yeah. So what I love about this beer is, um, in comparison to like uh, an actual New England style IPA, I mean, these are, these are big, big beers. I mean, it's, they're delicious, they go down easy, um, but they, they fill you up pretty fast. Um, the lager version of it, you get all that flavor and that smooth kind of juiciness, but it's really easy to put away a few pints of this without feeling too full. What do we have next? Next, so we're coming from our 
um, quarterly spring seasonal, uh, going to what is our um, small batch release. Just for, this was our February release. Mm -hmm. um, this is a sour. Uh, we have a new sour series that just started up called Bling Jacket. Hmm. So Bling Jacket is uh, it's a kettle sour. Um, we ferment it with a little bit of lactose. Um, heavily fruited, and then gets finished with just a hair, like a touch of vanilla. Mm -hmm. And so you get the tartness up front, big fruit in the middle, and it finishes just a little sweet. Oh, sounds very good. Sours are a great category of beer. Um, like I've got a friend who just, it doesn't matter what style of hoppy beer I've tried to share with them, he just does not like it. Mm -hmm. um, some people, it just, everyone has their own different tastes. And I find the people that are really into like uh, ciders and wines and think they might not like beers, uh, sours are often the thing that they get really excited about once they sort of figure out what that style of beer is. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were making that, did you have to separate that batch from everything else? Because uh, I've heard there can be cross-contamination. There can. Yeasts. So there's uh, two big styles of sours out there. There's your traditional sours, which is just uh, putting them in barrels and them sit there getting funky with a different strains of like wild yeast bacteria. Historically, like a lot of beer styles were kind of estimated to possibly be sours mm -hmm. uh, before we had controlled fermentation. Um, there's just a lot of wild mm -hmm. yeast out there and those type of beers that are sitting around in barrels with just a lot of active cultures, yeah, they can contaminate things. Um, this is what's called a kettle sour. Okay. And so the souring all takes place in our boil kettle. Mm -hmm. um, it's so once that's done and it gets transferred out, uh, it's really easy to sterilize the entire thing. I mean, uh, nothing survives that steam. This is um, this is very nice. It's uh, not like too stringent. Mm -hmm. I've mm -hmm. noticed it's it's a very mild sour, but it's still very pleasing. I would say uh, the first sour series we were doing, it's just it's been retired now in favor of this one. Um, it was our deadly series and that came about with our head brewer Mike and I talking one day about. Just uh, the whole sours, like kettle sours are fun. They're um, they're crisp, they're tart, they're refreshing, but there's usually not a lot of depth to them. Not not too different than drinking a glass of like lemonade. Whereas the uh, like traditional like Belgian sours, now those they get like all the complexity and nuance as like a really nice wine, um, a lot of depth to them, great flavor, and so just kind of throwing ideas back and forth over the course of a month to see if maybe we could possibly fake like a Flanders red which is one of my favorite Belgian styles, um, as a kettle sour. A traditional Flanders Red sits in barrels about a year and a half. Um, a kettle sour like this takes about three weeks to make. Our Deadly series was a lot of fun. Um, I thought that we did a really great job at approximating like the Flanders Red, um, but we're just kind of ready to try something else. It's a little bit more exciting and uh, palatable to the larger amount of people. Uh, we're going to be doing different flavors. Um, mm -hmm. So this was the start of our new kind of a uh, small batch releases. Um, there's going to be one every month. Um, we're doing a sour series, a dessert series, and a hoppy series. Mm -hmm. And these are going to alternate each month. So this month is going to be the dessert release. Um, but we'll have uh, four sours in total. Mango is the first one. Then we're planning to do key lime as the next one. Um, Midsummer we'll have a uh, peach. And then once we get into fall, right before the holidays, we'll have a cranberry. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yep. I'm really excited mm -hmm. about the cranberry. I think that's going to play really well mm -hmm. with like, the, the lactose and vanilla additions. That sounds good. What did you guys think of the sour? Oh, I like sours. I like sours. I love sours. I like this one. I thought the mango really was a nice touch. You're familiar with our Deadly series. Yes. What's your feeling on that versus this new direction? I like this better. Well, the ones that I had just became overly complicated. Yep. If you like a an ale or a stout, when you try a, other sours, it might be overwhelming, but this is a really delicate, Perfect. good That's sour. Perfect. That's exactly the goal for that one. Um, and like, we all really appreciated the past series. Like, it's fun to sit there and really pick out the, oh, there, there, there's a lot going on with it though. Mm -hmm. um, so this is going to be what we do all year. Um, then we're going to actually start like a proper, like, um, extended, like, barrel aging sour series. Mm -hmm.